We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Welcome to this main session of the Policy Network on Meaningful Access. Uh, my name is Sonia George. I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for Affordable Hi, Internet. Sonia, uh, we can't hear on the Zoom room, we can't hear the, the folks on site. Okay, can you hear me? The audio for IGFC. Okay, rights. can I have the technical team supporters? Apparently, uh, so Sylvie is our co moderator online. Um, can you check if you can yes. hear? Can you hear me yeah, now? We can. Yes, thank you, Sonia. Wonderful. Yeah. Let's make a quick check with everyone that is online. Uh, I want to make sure everyone can hear us. If you can see the chat, Sylvia, that would be great. All right. Thank you. Fantastic. All right, so let's restart again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this main session of the Policy Network on Meaningful Access. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. My name is Sonia George. I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet at the Web Foundation. And my co-moderator is Silvia Cadena from APNIC. And she is online, as many of you that weren't able to travel to beautiful Katowice in Poland. But we are happy to have many of us here uh, physically today, and many of you also online. So uh, our plan for this session is as follows. Um, I will give you a small introduction on our policy network and the reason for why we started this work and also around the concept of meaningful access. We will then have two keynotes, uh, one with the chair of the IGF MAG, Henriette Osternhuisen, if she makes it, uh, another one uh, with Marielza Oliveira, who's sitting right here to my left from UNESCO. Um, then we'll have three dialogues, short dialogues, uh, on three of the themes that this policy network has been focusing on. And then we will have a closing with a colleague from UN DESA, Mr. Zhu. So that's just to give you an idea of our plan. My uh, co-moderator, Sylvia, and I are going to uh, uh, share this task, and we hope that the internet and the online world will cooperate to make everything uh, very easy for us today and for all of you attending, not just here in person, but also around the world. So let me start by first uh, giving you a quick uh, introduction of why meaningful access and then we'll go into a couple of more details. I want to first clarify, before we go into the discussion, that our policy network on meaningful access was constituted precisely to support the thinking around this very important theme to bring digital inclusion to the world, especially, I would say, focusing on the massive inequalities and exclusion that we see taking place at the Global South. The way we think about meaningful access is very clear, and I hope that this will be clear for you all as well. Meaningful access is a combination of three key elements or ingredients, and that is affordable access, meaningful connectivity, and the social environment that supports and permits meaningful access to be possible. Affordable access, I think that's clear to all of you, it's about the cost that people have to pay to actually get a reliable uh, connection to the internet. Meaningful connectivity is the combination of factors that includes the frequency of use, the type of data, the speed, and the kind of device that people have access to really take full of advantage of the internet connectivity when they have the ability to pay for it. And the social environment refers to elements such as content, language, skills, capacity, and all of the complementary um, areas that are necessary to make sure that we can take full advantage of affordable, meaningful connectivity. 
And the reason I am clarifying these right at the outset of our session is because for us, meaningful access is really the means to achieve and to be able to fully benefit from meaningful use. So once you have meaningful access, then you can fully benefit from the opportunity of digital <laughs> development. So with that in mind, the policy network was established really to look at this question and especially to look at some of the areas that have not been looked at in detail yet. There are many colleagues around the world, including many that you will hear today from our policy network that are working in different areas of meaningful access. The UN uh, Secretary General's uh, Tech Envoy and the Digital Cooperation colleagues have been doing a lot of work, including with ITU and many partners, on defining the connectivity measurement framework that looks at some of the issues that we already are more familiar with. Uh, many of us, including ourselves at the Alliance for Affordable Internet, take very close look and with the ITU on affordability, on affordability issues, but as the policy network clearly identified, there are still some gaps in trying to understand those social environment elements that are just as critical to make sure that meaningful access is a reality to everyone at the global level. And so, with that in mind, I want to first say thank you to everyone, all the members of the Policy Network on Meaningful Access, and all the partners that have joined and have supported the work of this Policy Network in the last four to five months, and hopefully continuing into next year. I also want to thank and acknowledge the contributions of many of the organizations that have already submitted uh, submissions from our call to inputs for the report that will be provided by the Policy Network I, and to illustrate how we are thinking about these issues um, at IGF. And those organizations include ICANN, the Organization of American States, NCTEL, NUPAF in Brazil, the ITU Tech Envoy, UNESCO, LockNet at APC, a 4 ai um, IGF Italy, and many individual members that have already submitted really wonderful contributions. We invite you to continue submitting them through the end of this month so they can be integrated into the report that will be prepared by the Policy Network. And without further ado, I want to introduce our two keynote speakers. Let's start with Henriette Esterhuizen, who uh, is the senior advisor uh, for APC and uh, their former executive director. But most importantly right now, as you all know Henriette, the chair of the MAG at IGF. Henriette, it's a pleasure to have you here. We've known each other for many years and you've been an incredible advocate uh, very avid advocate for digital inclusion around the world. But I also wanted uh, to ask you today in your keynote to tell us a bit more about your leadership here at uh, the MAG and why this idea of a policy network so you can contextualize the importance of this policy network on meaningful access this year at, at IGF and really your views on how it should continue. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. I actually remember when I first met you. It was 1996 in Pretoria, <laughs> or 1997 at Now you say too much about our age. I know. No, I think, um, thanks, thanks to Sonia, to everyone for being here. I think that, that access and the access divide, it, it's this topic that we've been talking about at the IGF since the inception. In fact, the WSIS was inspired by this understanding that we need to collaborate as a global community to bridge this divide. And yet we not, you know, yes, of course the numbers have changed, but, but, but the divide is still, or the, or the lack of meaningful access, and I really completely reinforce and, and, and support the definition that Sonia presented, we're still so far away from that. And I think what we needed, or, and what I hope this, this uh, policy network can achieve is to, to go beyond just looking at what needs to be done, because I think to a large degree we actually understand what needs to be done. 
We know we need dynamic approaches to spectrum management and regulation. We know we need to empower local communities to connect themselves. We know we need to have regulation by our telecommunications sector to ensure that operators are fair and competitive and that pricing is not overly exploitative. We need to know that we need national solutions. I'm looking here at my MAG colleague, Ucha Seturi from Georgia, where as a, at a national level, they've developed solutions to, to achieve access. So I think we also need to not just look at why do we not have the kind of access that we want. We need to know at, we need to look at why are the solutions that we know work not being implemented across the board. So um, I think we need to be positive, but we also need to confront what those barriers are. Um, but saying that, Sonia, I've certainly seen, and maybe the pandemic is part of that, but just looking at the recent Kenyan license for community networks, the Brazilian regulator has um, providing licenses to use television white space frequencies for community networks or local access provision. The Argentinian regulator has come to the table. Mexico led the field with its social purpose license. So I think we're beginning to see innovation. Um, but I do think that this policy network can build consensus, strengthen that consensus, communicate those recommendations, but I hope also can find ways of, of using the multi-stakeholder process of the IGF to have some serious conversation as well about why uh, what we know will work not actually happening. Is it financing that's the, the gap? Is it vested interest uh, um, that is creating a barrier? So I do think that, that, that it can play that role and hopefully really um, take us a step further from consensus to actually implementation and I think also to monitoring. Um, and evaluating. And I think this is why it's fantastic to sit here with the UNESCO team, because I think the UNESCO Internet Universality Indicators gives us a framework to actually, uh, on an evidence base, begin to understand what those bottlenecks are. Thank you so much, Henriette. Really excellent points. Um, very much to the core of the questions here, of course. And you will see throughout the session today precisely how the policy network, looking at all of these questions that Henriette very well laid out, why we decided to look at three specific areas of interest that we also felt not only we could um, build on the work that has been done before, but really fill the gaps of what has not been done. Because I think even though a lot of consensus exists around what needs to be done. The reality is that there are no common frameworks that can be followed everywhere around the world. They have to be different, of course, for different regions, but there is guidance that is very useful around meaningful access and the different elements of meaningful access. And I think many of us in this network have worked in different uh, parts of that. Um, but you, the UNESCO team that Maria also leads um, with the Rome indicators is one of those uh, teams Teams. They've been focusing tremendously on how to then create the evidence to look at some of these questions that are actually the hardest to measure, especially around content, language, skills, and the kinds of things that outside of the Rome network, there haven't been any common way of not only understanding, of comparing, but then also to suggest recommendations on how different governments can address. So Marielza, it is such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you presented to us before and it was so enlightening. So thank you for being here, welcome. And we look forward to hearing from you and your colleague on the amazing work that you and UNESCO are doing on the Rome Indicators. So please, on to you. No, thank you, Sonia, and uh, thank you, Henriette. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to be here with all this fantastic uh, uh, um, group um, that uh, is working on, on meaningful access. I think this is the meaningful uh, policy network, you know, in all senses of the world. So uh, let me go um, about uh, presenting to you what the Rome uh, framework is. Um, how do we get these slides on, please? Um, who is showing these slides? Uh, hello. Um, oh, thank, yes, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me start by saying very quickly, you know, UNESCO actually works on the uh, free flow of ideas by world and image. 
So for us, you know, the, the internet is not just um, the infrastructure, but it's actually more the interactions and the relationship that happens, the global marketplace of ideas, goods, and services that exist. And of course, for us, you know, for all of us here, the issue of inclusiveness in this global uh, uh, marketplace is a critical element, and it's been part of the of the discourse on the internet from the very beginning. You know, we talk about the digital divides. You know, uh, both our colleagues here already mentioned the, the digital digital divides, but the digital divides were always, you know, in the beginning thought about more in terms of infrastructure and uh, connectivity than actually about how to really gain meaningful content, meaningful knowledge, meaningful information from uh, the internet. So for us, you know, the issue of inclusiveness is there as well. We talk about accessible by all, but not just about connectivity in terms of the, of the infrastructure, but about, you know, being able to really benefit uh, from the content that the internet has to offer. And for that, we look at uh, you know, uh, the human rights framework, the freedom of expression, the access to information elements of that framework, and, and say you know, the, the internet should be bringing us um, closer to realizing well-being for all, you know, uh, for example, through the uh, sustainable development goals uh, um, elements. And for us, you know, the key issue is to really look at uh, how you know, do we compile evidence that helps us measure whether this well-being is happening, if there is inclusion on the internet indeed uh, in those frameworks, and to compile the evidence that helps us to design the policies that help us move forward in those terms. So uh, let me talk about the Rome framework, uh, which is uh, a process that uh, was a very participatory process for it to, to be developed. Uh, it happened in three stages. Um, phase one, a phase of research in which we examined and searched, consulted a large group of, uh, of, uh, of uh, stakeholders all around the world uh, to identify what principles should be uh, uh, the principles that really enable us to benefit from the internet and what kind of internet we would like to build. Uh, then a phase two in which we are looking at how to measure uh, and compile evidence um, to show us whether we're in the right direction and help us to develop policy in that sense. And then a phase three in which we really tested and pilot and validated this framework so that we could say, yes, this works and that helps you know, countries to move along. So the Rome framework was born out of a, you know, enormous consultative process. It was actually led by, you know, uh, um, Henriette, uh, uh, who was, you know, part of this group here. You know, um, one of the mothers of uh, of, of uh, the Rome framework, and it compiled three, you know, 303 indicators in five categories uh, and with uh, different themes. Uh, first, contextual indicators. Then, human rights-based ones. Openness. Uh, accessibility, a multi-stakeholder approach, and cross-cutting issues uh, that help us to understand the, the context in which uh, people live in terms of digital ecosystems. Are these digital ecosystems truly human rights-based, open, accessible by all, and governed by multi-stakeholder participation? So, um, I started with these contextual indicators because, of course, different uh, uh, in the, uh, digital ecosystems depend on having, you know, uh, um, population size, you know, investment capacity, and so on, governance uh, elements, and so on. Um, so we had contextual indicators for that, but then we developed five categories, uh, which I had already mentioned, and under each of those, rights, openness, accessibility, mode stakeholder participation, cross-cutting themes, we had, you know, uh, uh, various themes, and I'm going to go through um, various ones just uh, to show you what they look like. You know, on rights indicators, for example, we start by looking whether, you know, the, there is a, a human rights framework in the country uh, or in, the, uh, uh, in that particular location that really, you know, it's re regardless of whether it's online or offline, it's, it's enabling um, 
um, the implementation of, uh, of uh, and the practice of, uh, of, uh, of uh, human rights. But then we look at our very specific human rights that are meaningful and important for the internet. Freedom of expression, right to access to information, freedom of association, the right to privacy, and participation and, uh, and benefiting from social, economic, and cultural rights. Openness indicators are the same. We're looking at whether there is an open standard, an open market, open content being offered, open data and open government, uh, so that we can all benefit from the uh, uh, content of the internet and share that in a meaningful way. Accessibility to all is actually you know, the same. We're looking at uh, whether there is a regulatory framework that really enables and mandates access you know, to everyone and we look at uh, accessibility in terms of connectivity, in terms of affordability, the elements that, uh, that uh, Sonia has already uh, mentioned, whether it's mandated that we have equal access, you know, that uh, there are, no one is left behind in that terms, and, but also in terms of availability of local content and language. Just on language, for example, there are 7,061 languages in usage around the world, but only less than 300 online, you know, actively used online. And then we look at the capabilities and competences. Can people really understand and are able to use content that they find? Is the, uh, do the people who have access have the skills to benefit from that access? And so those are the elements that we find absolutely meaningful. And then on most stakeholder indicators, we're looking at uh, you know, whether this framework is consistent with international norms, you know, uh, such as you know, the human rights uh, uh, frameworks, and whether there is a mechanism for internet governance at local level, as well as representation from, that, uh, uh, from the national level at regional and international level, in which most stakeholder participation is nurtured and, and uh, enabled. And finally, we want to know whether there is gender equality, if children are safe, if the internet is promoting sustainable development, if it's trusty, wor trustworthy and safe for people to, uh, uh, to benefit from it, to participate in it, and whether legal and uh, ethical aspects of the internet are really taken care in terms of, uh, is information being manipulated? Do we have you know, elements to, uh, um, to um, without this information, hate speech, you know, uh, uh, extremism, and so on. So these are the elements that we look at. Uh, and uh, let me call on my colleague, uh, Shang Hong, to tell you a little bit about how we got to that framework in the first place. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mariosa, for giving the floor. And also, I'd like to thank our moderator, Sonia, for allowing for such a comprehensive presentation from UNESCO. Actually, I want to also thank all of you in the room and also online. The UNESCO Romex principles indicator is act, it's actually a product uh, outcome from the entire IGF uh, since UNESCO engaged with uh, all of you for the past 15 years. So the unique uh, strength of this instrument uh, is to not only stopping at the beautiful principles defending international standards, but uh, really operational analyzing them to national level, to conduct a national assessment, to see the performance of governments, the performance of private sector, and all stakeholders, whether they are really respecting and advancing those human rights and other open standards of the internet, which can really be enabling the whole internet to be a public good to benefit all of us. So the most transformative implementation strategy I want to highlight is a first step on this slide. For each country to do this ass assessment, the first step is to create a multi-stakeholder advisory board. That's a wonderful experiment to trigger multi-stakeholder dialogue among governments and other actors to have the consensus. The country needs this assessment. The country's policy needs such a transformative uh, evidence-based uh, approach. Then, 
we are having so many countries embracing this framework. The latest one is from Germany. I carry a personal copy of a German report. They have assessed 109 indicators to assess how Germany will going to uh, advance all its digital uh, ecosystem and as a leader in this global governance of digital transformation. I really re recommend all of you to go to our website to download all those uh, already published reports and also continue support to all those existing process in 34 countries now across five continents. We're also calling for more member state countries, stakeholders to join us to assess your uh, national in internet the ecosystem by using our indicators. Um, my, my colleague Mario and me, we are our team here, we are here to support you. This slide shows you that despite of the pandemic, the multi-stakeholder advisory board works very well through online or hybrid to trigger the national discussion to guide the entire national assessment in all our countries being assessed. Then I also like to show you this slide, my favorite one. It's a last step when a country fin finalizes its assessment to organize a national multi-stakeholder validation workshop. Very often, it takes place on the occasions of the national IGFs and also other national multi-stakeholder forums like uh, Internet Society events or others. It really works well, combined fitting so well to national digital uh, discussion. To, to, uh, to trigger discussion on the recommendations and actions they are going to take to improve the policy after the assessment. Um, yeah, I'm very uh, cautious of time. Internet universality goes beyond the internet. It's all about the digital policy. It's also applied to AI. As you all know, UNESCO has just uh, approved the, the AI ethics recommendation. So I call all of you to join our meeting tomorrow of the Dynamic Coalition uh, Room X at 9.30 in Room Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. This is really wonderful to see. And it's great that so many countries have already started doing several assessments. I want to take the opportunity to actually invite all of you here and online to join the session immediately after this one here today, another main session that will focus specifically on how we can achieve a multilingual internet. Um, content in different language, different languages around the world is absolutely essential for what we are looking at uh, as meaningful access. So we'll have a session dedicated to that immediately after these, and I invite you to, uh, to join us. So thank you both, Henriette, Maria Elza, Jiang Chung, uh, for your presentations. It's wonderful. Really appreciate it. Stay with us. I'm sure there will be questions later. Um, and I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Silvia Cadena, who's online, co-moderating with me, to start the next phase of our session today. Silvia, uh, let us hear you. We want to make sure we can hear you OK? Hey, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Maybe we can have the sound a little bit louder. Uh, technical team, please. Go ahead, Sylvia. Thank you. Good evening from Eastern Australia. Um, I guess let's the weirdness begin. <laughs> to trying to um, have a dialogue with Henriette and Marielsa is the, the first part of this uh, conversation. Um, I'm Sylvia Cadena. I work at the APNIC Foundation. Um, I'm here in Australia. I wish I was with you in Katowice, but uh, hopefully uh, travel will uh, start again for us in, to a certain degree in the future uh, to recharge the batteries, which is what the IGF has always done uh, for a number of years in my life. I, I miss the opportunity to be with you uh, over there. So Henriette and Marielsa, thank you very much for your initial uh, remarks. I particularly like um, the fact that uh, both of you highlighted the importance of trying to find common ground and, and methods to understand what we know and what we don't know and how those efforts around uh, indicators and um, capturing evidence and finding ways to analyze it can bring us um, to an understanding about what uh, uh, access can mean in the, in the lives of people so that we can uh, measure in a way how meaningful that experiences is for those individuals. So with that, I, you know, after this initial conversation with the two of you, we are going to have um, 
a, a couple of uh, blocks of conversations with different speakers that are uh, joining us remotely, some in, in, in Katowice, uh, some others. Um, so I, I hope that the, there is not, not much delay and that it all uh, works fine. So uh, Henriette, my first question is to you. I think you, are, you have to leave us uh, very soon. But I hope that you can stay at least for this initial conversation with Maria Elsa. Um, you you mentioned uh, on the importance to try and figure out what we don't know, um, and we you focus about on or your your intervention. You try to raise our attention about what can we do to identify the structural barriers that have um, led us to the point where. 30 years down the track, and we are still talking about some of the same issues that uh, were part of the conversation at the beginning. Um, it, it is true that um, we, we don't necessarily have to focus only on the services and applications that are online, because there are a, lo a lot of people that are not connected yet. So what, what will be your thoughts based on your experience and what all the discussions that you've seen around the IGF about those um, structural barriers? What do you um, think you have learned and what can you share with us today? Oh, thank you, Sylvia. Um, I wasn't expecting that, but I will, I will try. I think um, um, maybe three things I would highlight. The one is that, and that's the maybe the hardest one, but that, that we always have to consider um, that that we're dealing with a, you know, that that access divides are rooted in social and economic divides, and and that and that structural inequality really underpins this this divide. And I think there's this there's this phenomenon which my colleague from Research ICT Africa, Alison Gilwald, always I think captures very well that there's a kind of a digital inequality paradox. As one needs smartphones to be able to 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 access, you know, really useful internet applications, um, it means those that don't have the resources to access those or to have those devices are left behind. You know, as we have the pandemic and people are using the internet for education, then those who do not have the devices to be able to interact with the internet in that way do not have access to education. So, in a sense, the more the tech universe offers people, the bigger the gap um, and, and the greater the impact of the exclusion of those who cannot benefit from it. So, so one would think that as tech advances and becomes more cost effective, the divide would grow, slow, grow smaller, but it actually doesn't. Then secondly, I think you know, the, the, the global community isn't very good at acknowledging that there's not just one solution <laughs> to, to a problem. And I, and I think that what happened in our world is that in the sort of early 2000s, mid 2000s, the mobile, um, the rapid growth in mo mobile penetration and also the voices of mobile, mobile operators actually captured the access narrative. And I think there was this kind of sigh of relief uh, access has been solved. We just have to wait for mobile coverage to get bigger and for people to have access to devices, and that will be it. There will be no more divide. And of course, that um, has been a myth, but in fact, many policymakers and many donors did buy into that, that argument. And I think what we see now is the results of um, that not actually working, and we see mobile data usage, in fact, leveling off, even though coverage is getting bigger. And then I think thirdly, it's really just about, it's about accepting the complexity, but also accepting the simplicity. I think we have to have an access ecosystem. Um, community networks are an important part of that. Um, mobile data and, 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 and mobile networks and the role they play is a very important part of that. Municipal networks are an important part. School nets are public libraries and public access is an important um, part of that. We need to remember that access is ultimately about people. And to get people to be able to benefit from this, you're going to need a 
complex different system of solutions that, that is context relevant and, and context sustainable. And I think that is so important. And I think that's why the current movement for local access provision, which is really driven um, by regulators and financing institutions creating an enabling environment, but driven from local uh, communities themselves. That's why it's so powerful, because it has that sustainability um, built into it. But it has to be an ecosystem, and all of these things, commercially driven access, local nonprofit access, local small business driven access, public access in schools and libraries, all of that has to be part of the solution. And I think that's what we struggle with. I think people like to have things simple, um, but they're not always. But they can be, provided you can get your head around the complexity and diversity of the solutions. Thank you, Henriette. Those are um, very uh, conducive to the question that I have for Marielsa coming up. I want to acknowledge that there is a question from the remote hub in DACA, but um, I would uh, appreciate if we could, you can uh, let Marielsa react first, and then we would give the mic to open your question. Okay? Um, so, Marielsa, in, in reaction to what Henriette uh, just um, said, in considering the complexity of the wrong indicators framework, right? That is trying to measure and identify how the many different elements, many different um, um, organizations and stakeholders involved in all of this uh, process uh, of bringing meaningful access to people. Um, what is your experience in organizations that are looking at all of these framework and, and embracing the complexity of measuring so many things at the same time. What is what is your your in, what are your insights in, in that sense about uh, trying to map what we don't know and what we do? No, thank you, Silvia. This is a really great question. But uh, you know, in my view, we are not actually measuring, you know, uh, such a diverse uh, um, set of things. We're actually measuring one thing. We're looking at the diversity, the wonderful, beautiful diversity of the human family, you know, and, uh, and looking at how different people uh, extract meaning from a, an environment in which, uh, uh, in which they participate. And uh, what uh, Henriette said is absolutely true. You know, in the beginning, we concentrated on access, not necessarily meaningful access, simply because access was the big issue. You know, it was the issue of the day, expanding the number of people who are online. And of course, when we started with this, you know, people online, we have a homogeneous group of people online. They are upper class, they are well-educated, they speak foreign languages such as English, they are able to participate in these ecosystems, you know, on a, on a very simple uh, uh, way, you know, regardless of where they are. But once we start bringing in the diversity of the human family, you know, for this diversity, you need to actually have content in different languages. You have to have content that, you know, uh, uh, that is accessible for persons with disabilities. You have to actually have, you know, uh, the different types of elements that really make content meaningful to different people. And uh, you, of course, you need content that uh, responds to the needs of rural areas rather than just uh, you know, the urban areas and so on and so forth. That's when we start realizing that uh, you know, if we want people to actually you know, benefit from this incredible, amazing resource that the internet is, you know, the capabilities that it offers for us to, you know, to construct true meaningful knowledge societies, we actually have to enable their full participation on an equal basis and, and with everyone. So we start realizing that uh, women may not be participating so much simply because they are not the engineers or they're not the technicians and so on and so forth. So that's when we, these issues come to play and then that's what these indicators are looking at, the complexity, the diversity of the human family, family which is one issue and how we derive meaning of things. Thank you. Thank you, Marielsa. That is a, a, a very uh, positive way to explain the, the, the complexity versus simplicity uh, that, that we face in these in this discussions. Uh, with that, I will pass the microphone to the, the 
um, have in, where was it? Uh, Raquel, sorry, I'm looking at the... Sylvia, so... Rebecca, do you have, please, to, to yes. the conveyor question? Hello, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, you are. Thank you so much, and getting from the oversight. Uh, first of all, heartfelt gratitude for this beautiful session. All the speakers here are prominent. You are uh, giving us a lot of ideas. Um, obviously, this will help achieving the sustainable development goals for sure. But I had a concern. Can you kindly enlighten me about the measures to promote policy network meaningful access in remote areas? Also, how can we make the internet safer for teens and kids? Because as we know, there's so much fishing in the metaverse right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maria Elsa, Henriette, uh, Sonia, which one of you wants to answer that uh, question? Let me start with a comment, um, if that's okay. And um, are there any other questions, Raquel? I just want to know how much time we need. Two more, okay, because we're running a little bit late. Sylvia, we need to uh, catch up. So just two things I want to say. Great question, and indeed we are very concerned about rural areas and remote areas and the different dimensions really of the inequality that exists in those areas, just as Marielza was pointing out. All of those dimensions of, um, of that the Rome, net, the Rome indicators cover. I want to note, and I hope it, you don't mind me doing a very important plug here, we actually at the Alliance for Affordable Internet are doing um, the first global measurement report on meaningful connectivity, so the technical elements that support meaningful access. And we will launch in January the first report that will share information about the rural, urban, gaps that exist around the world precisely around this issue of meaningful connectivity. So I urge you to uh, stay tuned and look at that. I'm going to share some of that later on in another session. But I wanted to point that out because it is an absolutely important uh, task to do, to make that measurement, not because we want to know what it's already there. Most of us here in this room and our colleague online knows the realities of uh, rural inequality and exclusion. What I think we need to bring together is precisely what Henriette was saying is, can we make the solutions that we know work, or many of the solutions like community networks, public access, and the variety of public access solutions to become a reality in those areas? And how can we make that happen through policy and regulatory action? That is what our policy network is really intending to motivate and incentivize policymakers to do. And I'm really looking forward to that possibility for us to use this knowledge, our collective knowledge, to guide those policymakers to go beyond what the data is showing us and starting to transform their uh, frameworks to actually put these things in place so that it's not just in Mexico or in Brazil or in Kenya, but frankly in Bangladesh. Uh, in every, where you are, I believe, and every other country where communities want their own community networks, their rural cooperative, or whatever other kind of alternative mechanism of providing meaningful connectivity um, is there that can be supported. And I think that is one of the critical tasks ahead. So Sylvia, I hope that answers the question and I'll pass it on back to you for the other questions. Sorry, Sylvia, was, was, was the question about phishing, about, about um, like cyber insecurity? I didn't catch the question. Is that what? It, about well, a safer internet. Of, uh, I want to respond just very quickly to that. I think that we know that abstinence did not work to prevent HIV. Um, I think that by, by dealing with the potential harm that people might suffer from having access to the internet, becoming victims of cyber crime or, or, or dis or misinformation, we're not really going to solve the problem. The problem is empowered use, supported use, and good law enforcement capacity, having um, governments take this issue of the victims of cybercrime perhaps as seriously as they sometimes take their fear of people using social media during elections, that will solve that problem. So it is a real problem. We have to take care of that. But let's not use that concern as a, as a, as a barrier to actually giving people first the power, the positive power of access, and then we'll find solutions to the potential harm. 
Thank you, Henriette, for adding that. I missed that part of the question. Sylvia, uh, our colleagues from UNESCO would like to add a point. Is there, uh, can we do that? Yes, that's just very um, okay, short if possible. Okay. 30 seconds. You know, I would say that in complement to that, I would say that we need to truly, you know, look at the skills users have. You know, and for us, you know, the media and information literacy uh, of users, uh, educating them on using media and information in a healthy, safe way is absolutely essential. So we do have a lot of different mechanisms for that, and we invite you to UNESCO's website to find out, you know, how we can help with that. Thank you. Um, I just Thank want to add a, may, may I add one last point on this access thing. From the countries we have assessed the uh, Romex indicator in 34 countries, a very strong call for having the internet as a human right to be legalized, to be protection, to be protected by law, to be prioritized by the government as a very powerful way to really ensure the equal access by the rural people, by the people with disability by the vulnerable groups in the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we will wrap now this initial first block to move to the, the, the dialogue around connectivity, which is a good segue to some of the comments that, that we have received um, uh, from the audience in the chat and also from the speakers in the room. And thank you very much to Henriette and Marielsa in, a, in um, the other lady, sorry, I don't have your name in my notes um, uh, for your interventions. So now I would like to welcome Carlos Ray Moreno and Jane Coffin. Um, Carlos, uh, are you there? Are, do you, do you, can you activate your video so that the IT support people can pin you on the... We see them yes, well, Silvia. We see Carlos and Jane and you together. Go ahead. Good. So, uh, Carlos, if you don't mind, I, I will leave you to introduce yourself and Jane the same, so I don't have to read from long bios. I'm not very good at that. Um, I am absolutely delighted uh, to have you here. You are extremely uh, uh, well uh, versed experts on different sides of how we, we do this uh, conversation around connectivity. So please uh, start with your remarks, uh, Carlos, and then followed by Jane, and then we will have a few questions for those in the audience that would like to add questions around uh, the connectivity conversation, please uh, put them in and we'll see how we can fit them. Thank you. Go ahead, Carlos. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Silvia. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, sorry if my voice is a bit cranky. I'm coming out of a big flu. So, but it's a pleasure to be here. And I did wanted to support the work of the policy network, which I believe is is really great. And also to point out that it's really unfair to go after Henriette and Marielsa and the amazing comments and interventions that they made. I really don't know what else I'm going to bring into to this. Anyway, my name is Carlos Rey Moreno. I work for the Association for Progressive Communications, uh, co-leading the Local Networks Initiative that uh, has been working together with our partner, Trisomatica, for the last four years on creating an enabling ecosystem for community networks in the in the global south, working very closely with Jane, with ISOC, with with many of, of you here, with Sonia, with Silvia, with many of you here in the in the panel and on the on the policy network. At the moment, we are supporting 30 initiatives in around 16 countries in the global south, which I guess give us a unique perspective into some of the questions that you've been asking. Um, and I guess the question that I, I thought I had to answer was, what do you see is possible when communities are empowered to share and develop their connectivity experiences? And I, I think Henriette has already answered that question, but I had some notes here. And it started with the, the slogan that is impossible is nothing, right? Uh, as much as traditional operators have contributed to, to closing the digital divide, there are many places where simply they are unable to provide affordable connectivity and uh, or provide connectivity at all and therefore alternative solutions are, are required, right? So communities around the world, especially in the jurisdictions where regulatory frameworks are conducive, have been doing this for some time now and uh, have organized themselves to meet their own communication needs. And now we see communities deploying and operating all sorts of telecommunication networks from fiber to LTE, 
already 5G networks in some places in the UK, being, you know, Wi-Fi, also the most common technology for all of them, but also pulling resources to create their own routers, their own towers, to communities learning and setting in place innovative sustainability models that allow them to pay the operating expenditure required to run the services uh, and allow the services to be many times cheaper than those offered by traditional operators. So there are solutions there, as Andrea was mentioning. We know what is working in places where, where the, the traditional models are not are not reaching, right? So, and we know what is missing. Where the, 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 there is, you know, all those licensing frameworks, those um, that access to mobile broadband spectrum that is not used in in rural areas and that should be shared. And we should continue working on creating frameworks to share that spectrum so communities are able to provide mobile broadband uh, in in areas where operators are not interested in to do so or it doesn't make sense for them to do so. It is very encouraging to see the ITU supporting with, with language community networks in the recent couple of years, especially this year. And hopefully that helps creating more traction. And in relation to the meaningful connectivity conversation, I think, you know, by, by the communities providing themselves and solving their own problems, there is a, a big element of meaningfulness, no? If they go to the point of learning how to do all this. But as Sonia, as Marielsa were mentioning, there are many other elements that are required. And then this, I guess this evolution in the conversation is also making us think a bit through what is beyond connectivity, right? All those other elements around, it's not that we were not thinking about them, right? But now many other, many other institutions, many other people, many other stakeholders are starting to realize that skills, devices, powers, content, language, et cetera, are super important to, 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 to connectivity, that connectivity is just an enabler. Of course, it does matter how connectivity is provided and the autonomy and agency of, of how the connectivity is provided does matter. But those other elements are important to consider. And even in the in the richness of the complexity that, that, that Maria Elsa was putting, there is a, in the complexity of the human diversity, there, there is a lot of richness. And, and in the initiatives that we are working with and in the way they are trying to provide access by themselves, the conversation is becoming richer and richer around who and how people get access to shared devices, which type of content is made available locally, what type of content is created locally, how that content is made available, you know, how there are many questions that are becoming really interesting as the conversation evolves, as the conversation, as these initiatives that are really providing connectivity from the bottom up and from the co from the communication needs of the communities are starting to engage more and more with these technologies with this infrastructure the questions are become the questions and the solutions are becoming richer and i i really hope i really hope that us as a policy network and i'm really looking forward to to read the the feedback that that we receive from the from the from the call that that was put, uh, put that was put out because I think sometimes we are very disconnected. I think uh, one thing was what Henriette was saying around how many people are still stuck on telecommunications being only something that uh, monolithic uh, operators were able to provide from the submarine cables all the way to the last mile. But I think. There is an, another disconnection. And I think that that other disconnection, we are bridging it, right? And community networks is on the forefront of many policy discussions and whatnot. But I think there is another front that is opening for us and that, that we need to, to listen more and to be more present and to understand what meaningful connectivity means for the communities. I think what Marielsa said was very important. I think not only connectivity was consider from that homogeneous component of humanity, but meaningfulness as well. And I think as we go deeper onto how connectivity is provided, meaningfulness is becoming also richer in its definition and more diverse. And I think 
I really hope as a network we listen and I really hope as a network we are able to capture all that richness and incorporate it in recommendations so more communities are able to use ICTs for whatever purposes they feel they they can become, you know, more autonomous. Anyway, thank you. Gracias, Carlos. Um, there are a few questions that uh, on the chat that if, if you don't mind to engage uh, on the chat, Carlos, would be great. Uh, then over over to you, Jane, if, if you would like to take the floor, please. You bet. Thank you, Sylvia. And thank you to everyone for um, at the IGF in Katowice. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Um, and just uh, looking across the screen I'm looking at right now, and talking to you, of course, over the interwebs. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, like Carlos, I've been involved in connectivity uh, at the Center of Technology Policy and Development for over 20 years. Um, most recently, uh, I've turned to at the Internet Society when I was there. On the last 10 years, internet exchange points and community networks, so local connectivity solutions, working with a multiplicity and a diversity of actors whether it's the United Nations, a local government, local chiefs, tribal communities, you really have to, as Carlos said, listen. You've got to figure out what the local circumstances are in order to help with local sustainability for local connectivity solutions. And as some of the other speakers have mentioned, you need a diversity of options for connectivity. There is no one connectivity technical solution. There is no one human uh, connectivity solution. We often would say when I was at the Internet Society, the human nets are 85% of the challenge building the human engineering to build an infrastructure or a network because the technical side, we have options. We have new transceivers and receivers. We've got companies putting in submarine cables and new LEO systems. We've got transceivers that will help us with Wi-Fi connectivity or more mobile solutions, agile mobile solutions. Guifi in Spain has been deploying some of those solutions. Argentina, a network that um, I know the Internet Society worked with in a very remote Patagonia area, LTE, open base stations, open standards, open connectivity, helped during the pandemic. It's those diversity of solutions, many different types of technologies and different local solutions that will help us move forward. But I also want to say that it has been a challenge, of course, and I was asked whether or not I could answer the question of how we work to support the community networks um, across the United uh, the, the world and how we helped uh, bring in connectivity solutions and where some of the challenges were in, in doing that. And this is also policy and regulatory. Henriette mentioned it, Sonia has alluded to it. You can't forget that the infrastructure isn't everywhere and we've got to figure out a way to work with policymakers and regulators and it's data. We've got to have open data. We've got to have information out there. We have to have case studies so that people aren't afraid. Fear is one of the most debilitating aspects of changing regulations and policies to allow for that competition and the multiplicity of operators, whether it's a small municipal operator or a community network or a new um, 4G LTE um, network coming in. Uh, you've got to allow for more actors to come into the market that fear factor is again going to cripple um, more connectivity to more actors. And for connectivity to be meaningful, people have to have options and affordability. And Sonia alluded to reports and great data that's out there. Um, it takes, a, a, again, a multiplicity of actors. There are lots of different dimensions to, this, <laughs> to the solutions here because it's an integrated approach. And if COVID has shown us anything, it's not just the Ministry of Communication. It's not just the regulatory body that knows how to regulate uh, traditional networks. It's the ministries of education. It's the ministries of agriculture. It's the different communities on the ground who can help us with those solutions, but people need to talk to each other. And as Carlos indicated, we have to listen to each other. And if we aren't listening to some of those local solutions, we're going to it's going to take a much longer time to get connectivity rolled out to the places that we know need connectivity. It's a fact that connectivity improves your GDP. It's a fact that it increases local social inclusion. It's a fact it provides more options. If we don't have that ability to look at options, then we're going to not be able to provide connectivity that's sustainable. And as Henriette had mentioned, sustainability starts at that local level. 
what's also very important about getting data out there is for people to take a chance on change. We've got to change some of the regulations on spectrum, licensing, and financing. <laughs> financing models have got to change, and I know there's some really great solutions coming along. We've got to be able to um, take a chance and to let these solutions grow out there. Um, I've been in many meetings, and I also want to just thank um, UNCTAD, UNESCO, ITD, UNDP, UNICEF, I don't want to forget. I've watched over the last four to five years the UN agencies working more closely together, and this is fabulous. Um, they always have worked together, but even so now, there's been a regeneration of partnerships. And again, one thing I want to say that I've said in other meetings, partnerships are critical. You must not be the single point of failure as a partner. You've got to work across different organizations from civil society to the technical community, the organizations that Sylvia works with from the foundations to also the regional internet registries. So it's this integration and holistic attitude that is really going to move us forward. And there are solutions out there. Carlos has worked on many of them himself. Machuki, a former colleague of mine and still a partner, is going to tell you a little bit probably about capacity building and where around the world people have solutions. So we've got to take the chance. We've got to change the regulatory and policy environments to allow that meaningful connectivity to be deployed for people and for them to find connectivity meaningful to them. For my mother, it's staying in touch with me. For doctors in a remote area, it's getting that data to a hospital so that somebody can help do an analysis. It's different things to different people. And it's also, as Carlos had mentioned, it's empowerment. And when people are empowered at the local level, amazing things happen. We often call it the human chemical reaction when I see people in the same room. Um, I had the pleasure of being in Nairobi several years ago, working with Matuki and Carlos and some others to do a training. We had a very practical training on radio frequency spectrum and some other complicated things, which then was taken into the field and deployed in a rural area. Sorry, it was an urban area. A network was set up, but that was because people had come together to learn and work with each other. And they took that knowledge and went to other countries and brought that to those countries and worked on those local solutions. Please don't forget that infrastructure isn't everywhere. We need to unlock funding because only 1% of philanthropic organizations did um, dedicate funding to infrastructure. So others have talked to you about the importance of what infrastructure can do. I'm here to also continue to push for infrastructure and to indicate that there are ways for the major operators who are important economic champions to work with the smaller networks. There are ways to be creative on universal service funding and Sonia's got great reports going out about that. We really have to hit all those, those high notes and make sure that we're working together, but things have to change. And there are ways to do that. Papua New Guinea is using universal service funding to fund community networks. Mexico changed their licensing regime to allow social purpose licensing for indigenous communities for a community network. Argentina changed some of their um, rules and regs to allow for community networks in high mountain areas in Patagonia. Others can do it. Kenya just changed licensing. So that was with the FCDO in, um, from the UK. That was with APC and some colleagues from ISOC. So it does take uh, integration and communities working together. Thank you very much. My apologies to interrupt, uh, Jane. I'm trying to put messages on the chat for the speakers to remind them of the time, but it seems that the technology is not, not helping us. Uh, so I think you know, as we took um, the, a little bit more, more of time on this, on this block, um, I think I'm going to pass on the microphone to Sonia so that she can uh, drive us to the next block about uh, inclusion uh, uh, digital inclusion, uh, and I, I think that we will collect the questions that were in this blog to put it up, uh, them at the end, if that's okay. So thank you very much, uh, Jane and Carlos, for your great contributions, and over to you, Sonia. Thank you, Sylvia, Carlos, and Jane for great contributions, lots of good examples. So now that we covered alternative con connectivity solutions, so looking at the networks, looking at infrastructure, what next? How can people use it? Do people have the skills? Are they being included? And so I have the pleasure of having my wonderful colleague, Nenan Wakanma, uh, Chief uh, Web Advocate at the Web Foundation, as well as Roberto Zambrano from Bolivia, a MAG member and very active on digital inclusion 
inclusion issues, not only in Bolivia, but in the region, to discuss this exact topic. How do we bring about uh, the solutions that will really create and support inclusive societies. And so I'm gonna start with Roberto to give us a bit of an example of the experience in Bolivia, especially because Bolivia is also a country where you have a very large percentage of the population that is indigenous, that is marginalized uh, in many different ways. Um, and so give us your impressions on how in Bolivia you are addressing that and what are the solutions that you think might have been more successful that we need to consider moving forward. Thank you very much, Sonia, and great to be here with all of your colleagues. I think um, it's important to have a background of what uh, we're trying to achieve in, in, the, in the policy network work. Um, back in 2020, uh, we proposed with a, career, with a colleague of the MAC, uh, Karim Ardumani Mohamed, a uh, best practice forum in order to uh, face the important issue of universal access, even before the pandemic. So it was important for us to start that work that led us to have uh, organized a session last year uh, in which we had the pleasure to come with you in the, in the panel uh, regarding um, connecting and enabling the remaining billions. And finally, that took us to this stage, to the beginning of this year, to start our, our mm -hmm. policy network in, on meaningful access. And it's particularly important because this is the space where we can actually come up with different good experience about policies that we are um, looking all over the world, particularly in the global south. So I think it's really relevant to take advantage of this kind of experience in order to apply some of them in our local realities. I think that's really, really important of this work. Uh, there are some other examples, of course, of different sessional work that uh, using the IGF as, as in a space were pretty much successful, but I think this new format will allow us, as I said before, to have very concrete policy uh, solutions. And uh, um, as an example, in our case, and particularly during the, the pandemic, one of these good experiences that we can, we can think of was, as, uh, and very similar to what Jane said before, we actually uh, received a good news from the government uh, knowing that they were adjusting the framework, the regulatory framework, in order to make it uh, more flexible for operators of community networks in, in Bolivia. Um, this is important because, as uh, Sonia mentioned before, uh, most of the, a, a very good part of the population in Bolivia, um, in particularly in the indig uh, indigenous groups, are living in, in rural areas. And we already have um, very critical divides, very critical gaps in different uh, areas, such as clean water or sanitary services. But also, during the pandemic, we also were effect affected uh, regarding important sectors, such as education. So preventing many of our children, thousands of children, from having proper educational process. So, that, that was um, um, a very bad, that was a very, very critical situation, and we think that these kind of solutions that are going to take a while, that uh, it will start processes uh, for inclusion, for fostering inclusion, need to be started immediately. Need, uh, we need to learn about different other experience, and I think Policy Network is a f fantastic space for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Nena. I think everybody knows Nena from the internet, right? Uh, and if you don't, well, you do now. Uh, you are one of the strongest advocates for affordable and meaningful connectivity, for digital rights around the world, and overall for um, digital inclusion. Where do we stand? And from your perspective, what do we need to be concerned about and do to change the picture of inequality and exclusion that we currently have? Thank you, Sonia, for inviting me. My name is Nenna, I come from the internet. And it's been a wonderful time listening to all the eminent panelists and I've taken five pages of notes for myself. I would not add much to what's been said. It's been informative. Maybe I should take another approach. What not to do. 
since this is a policy network, and I'm hoping that you can drive message back. Um, I was reading uh, a study published by the Alliance for Affordable Internet on the cost of digital uh, divide. So for those who don't know, I'm a she, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm in West Africa, and I've been working from home for the past 19 years before the pandemic hit, right? With the pandemic, what we found out is that more work has been thrown on women as caregivers on paid work, as mothers who mentor children, and as workers. So permit me for the four minutes I'll be speaking to speak on the gender digital divide. The gender, the gender digital divide was assessed by Alliance for Affordable Internet in 32 uh, low-income countries, and the research shows that we've lost $1 trillion over 10 years because these women are not meaningfully connected. So what can we do? Um, $428 billion is what we need to get people connected. But then I want to talk to you about the policy framework at the Web Foundation. It's called REACT. So please look at my five fingers. It's R-E-A-C-T. R-E-A-C-T. And for the next four minutes or three, I'll be speaking about those. I won't be speaking about what we have to do again. I'll be speaking about what we don't have to do. And so on rights, thank you, UNESCO. Please do not think that access to meaningful internet is a, uh, it's a luxury. Do not think you are doing women a favor by connecting them. Do not think that, because we believe it's a right. On education, yes, we want to equip ladies with skills. Please do not leave the main and the patriarchal system out of the game. So while we want to upskill the women, we need to train the men to understand that women can run IT companies effectively. Thank you very much. On access, it is not enough to access. You and myself will work on meaningful access. That means that uh, having connectivity is not enough, but connectivity that allows you to be co-creative, that allows you to manage things. That is the kind of connectivity I have from Abidjan that allows me to work at the World Wide Web Foundation with my colleagues all over. Content is very important. So rights, education, access, content. As policymakers, we cannot depend on private sector alone to create content in English language. And I think the multilingual panel that will come after this attests to that. It is very important that those who are in Venezuela, those who speak their own language, also benefit because we create better when we create what resembles us. So let's not uh, be thinking that content should only be in major UN languages. With all due respect to the UN, we the people, we speak more than six languages. And T is target. Once again, I'm speaking about rights, I'm speaking about education, I'm speaking about access, I'm speaking about content, and now targets. You have a lot of these work that you do. But please, it is not enough to say we have 90% coverage. It is enough to know that the people who are connected are really connected, and to what detailed connectivity percentage we have. This is very important to me. It is not enough to say we have 100% coverage, we have 90% people uh, who, are, who, have, um, who, are, who have SIM cards. No, it's not enough. We want to know who is connected, how useful it is, and how much money is being made, and how lives are being bettered. So once again, folks, someone like myself, what I would like to see 
is that internet is my right, is that education includes not just men, uh, not just women, but the men who live with them and then who belittle their work. Not just that we have access, but we have meaningful access. Not just that we have content, but we have multilingual content. And not just that we have targets, but meaningful, accountable content. Thank, targets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nena. It's always inspiring to hear Nena, and I am so uh, honored to work with her on a daily basis. I think you made the case very clearly, and so did Roberto. Thank you both. We are very short on time, so I'm going to pass it quickly to Silvia to go on to the last block of the third theme of dialogues. And we're going to be very efficient, Silvia, to be very quick on that next 10 minute block and then closing. So thank you. Back to you. And thank you, Nen and Roberto. This was excellent. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, the last uh, block of uh, conversation uh, is around the third block of discussions that the Policy Network has uh, conducted uh, with this year. And we are very privileged to have Michuki and Margaret uh, to share uh, their experience um, uh, on the capacity building uh, uh, um, topics, let's say, which is very close to my heart. It's something that uh, we at the APNIC and the APNIC Foundation support. Uh, so over to you, Michuki. You have five minutes, and please have a look at your chat. I will s tell you when that time is done. Okay? Thank you, Michuki. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, my name is Michuki Mwangi. I am the Senior Director for Internet Technology and Development at the Internet Society. And uh, I'm glad to be here today and talk about something that I'm also equally passionate and uh, that we are also very passionate about at, at the Internet Society. And uh, to contribute to this conversation, because at the Internet Society, we do prioritize extending the Internet to communities that do not have it and to those actually that need it the most. And uh, we concentrate on building and empowering the movement of people to make sure that they're able to connect themselves as we believe in our vision that the internet is for everyone. And to start on this conversation, one of the things that we believe is that uh, the local technical communities or the local people are really at the pillar, uh, are the, are the pillar and at the center of the internet development. Um, we rely on them to provide the technical expertise that's needed to run this network infrastructure because without them, it's very difficult to provide a reliable service and an affordable connection to the internet. In fact, uh, we believe that the internet is strongest. There is a strong technical community that works well together and connects so many. So when we look at uh, access, um, access has many facets to it. And um, it starts from the physical component, which we've talked about. If, um, I believe Sonia mentioned some of this uh, as um, uh, relating to costs, affordability, um, the choice or the option to select which network you want to connect to, the resiliency that's provided within the infrastructure, and also um, the relevance um, of, of, the, of, of the access. Sylvia, are you with us? We just lost uh, you all. Okay, so let's just give them a couple of seconds. If the technical team could help us, it looks like we lost the connectivity with the online colleagues. Uh, we lost connectivity altogether. Oh. Okay, so it looks like the internet is down. Also here in Poland at IGF. Woo -hoo. Interesting. Uh, as I saw a tweet yesterday, someone made a comment about how the internet was being occupied in new and interesting ways. Okay. All right. So shall we stop for a few seconds and wait for you? Or shall we continue here? Okay, we can continue here, and then when we uh, regain connectivity, uh, okay, hope that sounds good. Um, 
Well, I'm fortunate to still have many of our colleagues here, including Henriette in the uh, audience. Uh, some colleagues had to leave. And we also have Mr. Zhuang Zhu, who's going to uh, come on stage and share with us some closing remarks. So I'm going to take advantage of inviting you, please. Um, Mr. Zhu is the director of the Division of Public Institutions and Digital uh, Government, DESA, at the UN, and of course, a key element to make uh, IGF possible. So thank you so much for joining us at the end of this session. Um, I wanted to take advantage, while we are waiting for our colleagues online, to give the opportunity to anyone in the room that we'll may have any- provide for technical toolkits or business toolkits, things that can be easily reused. And why is this important? Well, it's important because when um, community networks, for instance, uh, lose expertise, and they will do so very similar to when a network in an urban center or in the city, it becomes harder for them to replace the same skill sets because most people with the talent or the skills to run a network or understand how a, a network works will prefer to be employed in an urban center or in a city, not in a rural area. So if they lose a skill set or an expert, it becomes much harder for them to replace that position. And so having the tools for them to continuously be able to build the expertise and the skill sets within the, uh, the networks becomes an inherent need um, that they need to have in, in the way they operate. Second is the capacity model should, uh, building model should be holistic. Basically, um, you know, an ISP that's establishing an operation in an urban center is likely to have access uh, to a pool of individuals with the skill sets and expertise that they require. And they will come in already knowing what to do. Building the same um, in a rural area will really need, um, will, will really need um, the capacity to be developed of those people who are already existing in those, those, those rural areas. So we really need to be able to pay attention. Um, oh, I have one minute left. Okay, so, uh, like sorry, Sylvia. Sorry, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, uh, uh, let me conclude um, uh, with my last point. Um, so I, I just wanted to conclude that uh, previous point by saying that um, it really needs to cover everything from innovation and uh, creative thinking to how to run businesses and making sure that they are sustainable and everything else around it. Finally, and most importantly is develop the capacity of the local stakeholders. It's not just of the community networks, but also the stakeholders, the policymakers, to understand that the people running the community networks are not the usual um, uh, elite, well-exposed um, you know, people that are coming from urban centers. They actually have a different approach to things. And so they, needed to also, they need to be looked at differently. So I'd like to pause there. Sorry, uh, Sylvia, for running over, but thank you very much for the opportunity. It's, it's a horrible job to stop the flow of a conversation when you have so much to share. Uh, Margaret, over to you. Sylvia, I am going to share my screen to, to create a difference in this. Uh, again, thank you very much, Sylvia. I am Margaret Nyamburandongo, working for the Policy and Regulation Initiative for Digital Africa. Uh, is an, uh, PRIDA is an initiative of the African Union, the European Union, and the International Telecommunication Union. And uh, to go into your questions, what are we doing in PRIDA and what are the impacts that we are getting from our work? I'll first uh, tell you that uh, PRIDA has three main uh, tracks. Uh, the first track focusing on our broadband access that is both uh, supply and demand, and that is being implemented by the ITU. And then we have two tracks that we are implementing within the African Union Commission, and that is a harmonization of policy and regulations across the continent. And then we are doing capacity building, and that is why I am here. And capacity building within PRIDA, our focus is to ensure that, first of all, we are creating structures at the national, regional, and the continental level. And the second one is to ensure that we are building capacity and offering coaching services to our diplomats uh, to ensure that, first of all, uh, we are participating in global processes and we are contextualizing standards and what is happening in this global uh, space for our own interest. Uh, to show you how we work as PRIDA, that uh, in 2019, we came up with a, 
an implementation strategy after doing three baseline surveys to understand what is happening in the continent. What are the gaps in terms of capacity? What are the gaps in terms of our participation in global events? And with that, we came up with a strategy and de uh, developed a workflow where we said that at the national level, we want to work with national conveners. And these conveners, they may come from the government, from the public sector, from the internet community, from the media, whichever stakeholder group. And then we have the PRIDA focal points. And these focal points are mainly from the ministries, either the Ministry of ICT, uh, in most of the countries, you'll find those are the hosting ministries or the regulators. At the regional level, Africa, we have five regions. And uh, in each of these regions, we have a regional convener. And these regional conveners, we are working with the regional economic communities. The whole idea is to ensure that these, the IGFs, the school of IGs, they are anchored in a, in a, in a virtual, in a physical uh, space, that they are not just virtual. And at the continental level, we have the African Union Commission, which is a secretariat for uh, IGF as, as well as for the SIG, the AFRICIG. And again, we come at the global level in that. So how, what have we done so far and how are we implementing our work? That first of all, we emphasize 50-50 gender representation. As you will see, this has not been possible. And I know it has been discussed in various forums. Is an area we must address. Again, what we, we do is diversity in age. We recognize we need, the, we need the young, we need the old, we need the mid. So we need everyone in this digital space. And it is through this kind of a mix that you are able to get ideas from all angles. And again, inclusion of diverse multi stakeholder groups. The whole idea is to ensure that we are approaching these issues from different perspectives. What have we done so far that uh, at the implementation level, we came up with a curriculum uh, with our material that uh, is informed by Diplo work. Uh, we partnered with them last year to do for us a course. It's also informed by a training we did in 2019 that is focused on training the trainer. And the course runs for four days, completely very interactive. We have a lot of group work, chat, Zoom sessions, and we ensure that we are working with national trainers. The whole idea is to ensure that we are contextualizing everything we are doing. We want to look at the global issues, but at the same time, we look at them, how are they affecting people at the local level? How does it work for you as a, as a person? And again, we work with partners and collaborators that come from diverse fields. In most of the countries, we have implemented the School of IGs. I know ISOC has been a key partner in all, in all of this. What, uh, what is the status? In 2020, after the outbreak of COVID, we, have been, we were able to support nine countries to hold their first School of IGs. These are countries that had never had a School of IG or an IGF. These countries are Botswana, Madagascar, Eswatini, Liberia, Egypt, Mauritania, Morocco, Comoros, and Cape Verde. So all of these countries had their school of IG, diverse groups, age, gender, and the like. Again, in 2021, we supported eight new countries to hold their first school of IGs. This is Ethiopia, Guinea-Kani, Guinea-Konaki, Seychelles, Djibouti, Lesotho, Somali, Central Africa Republic, and Togo. Again, countries that are have been in the field for long, like Nigeria, they came to us and they wanted to us our content and we worked together to hold their school of IG. Again, we also worked with Liberia even after we supported them last year. And we also supported the West Africa School of IG that had quite a number of people drawn from 10 different countries. So far, we have trained a total of 11 at five participants across and we have had 23 training sessions. You want to tell me my time is over? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, Margaret, I hate it. <laughs> my apologies. Can if you don't just mind. go through this, yes. through these two slides that uh, in, some, in terms of gender gap, you can see what we have there, that in all the trainings, we have had 28% female representation. That is an area we need to work on. In terms of certifications, again, you see only 26%. The reason being, issues of connectivity that have been discussed uh, in the past, that uh, people are only able to connect for the four days that we are able to provide this connectivity, an area that we really need to work on. Again, in terms of sustainability, we have a pool of trainers that we shall be using across the continent in the coming years that have been trained in terms of the facilitation and they are ready to support us. Actually, we have already used them to support some of our schools of IG. So what are the outcomes? First of all, a ready pool of experts. 
again, we have seen people contextualizing what we are training them, that they are able to apply that in their livelihoods. We have seen public sector participants, uh, first of all, realizing that uh, issues to do with internet governance, they cut across. So there's no way they can work in, silo, in silos, and that is work in progress. And again, realization that by the participants that inaction and poor governance will increase digital divide, exclusions, and uh, social inequity. Challenges, and I know the previous speakers have spoken about them, we need to contextualize content that common people can relate with. That is a major challenge we need to deal with. We need to expand our net to ensure that other professions are getting in this space. The uh, people from the judiciary, the medical professions, engineers to ensure that cables are not just cut because people do not understand. And finally, affordable and usable broadband access. Thank you, Silva, and over to you again. Bye. Very sorry. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I, I don't know what we should do here, Sonia. Um, we, let me, let me pick uh, we, up. We were supposed to have a little bit of a conversation <laughs> between yes. the dialogues, but I don't think that's gonna work. Yes. Um, so we, we have let uh, the speakers provide their inputs and I think we will shrink this, the Q&A uh, part. There are a few questions in the chat room, um, some in other languages, which I will require some assistance to manage. Um, so I guess, you know, over to you to manage the, the questions and then we move to the last uh, portion that you will, um, it, we will model it together around looking ahead. If, if you don't mind, Sonia, I guess that's Thank a you. compromise we can do. Yes, no, that's fine. I, it, sadly, uh, we're going to have to take an executive decision. Sylvia, I don't think there's much time for Sorry, I can't hear, the, I can't hear the, the, the sound from the room. Uh, can you hear the sound from the room now? Technical team, if you can help us. Those of us on the Zoom call, we can. Yeah, can you now hear now? Thank you. Okay. So, yeah. because of time, and we have very little time, in fact, our clock is showing as one minute and 32 seconds, um, we're going to have to cut very short. So, and I really want, uh, I want to first of all thank everyone that joined us today. This is such an important conversation. I hope you can continue the dialogue online, through the chat, um, in many different ways that you can reach out through the IGS. So, please do that. Um, and I want to make sure that we use a couple of minutes at the end, uh, more than the one minute that is left on the clock, to not only welcome Mr. Zhu, the director of the Division of Public Institutions and Digital Government here with us, but also to thank him very much for your work and for everything that you're doing to make this uh, IGF a wonderful event. You are the director in charge and you heard the discussion today. We're very proud of being part of this policy network, but we wanted to welcome you, uh, to thank you, but also to hear from you. What do you think? Uh, what have you learned? And what do you think are your suggestions moving forward for this policy network? Thank you, Mr. Zhu. Yes, you can hear me now. Okay. Uh, before my time runs out, I do the first thing first. That is to thank Henriette, you, um, Silva, and my uh, Pedro, my colleague Raquet, and all the members uh, for contributing to this wonderful uh, policy network on meaningful access. That done, I also want to say that this uh, meaningful access is, is a great improvement uh, over the ongoing conversation. Uh, a lot of the ongoing conversation put emphasis on uh, connectivity, which is rightly so. But the emphasis is so much on the hardware part that we run the risk of losing uh, uh, the attention to the software part, that is building literacy, uh, building multi-language content, uh, meaningful content, and also building uh, technical skills. So that part uh, for meaningful access is as important as the investment in, in, in the infrastructure. So I'm uh, very much grateful for all the uh, uh, volunteers who have uh, joined this, uh, uh, this group. And the membership of the group itself is an innovative uh, thing of the IGF. Um, there, there was a suggestion this morning that the IGF should uh, tap into resources outside uh, the IGF itself. And this group is an example in that direction. So I hope that the membership will continue uh, in the next phase. And secondly, the message of the work of this group is very unique. It's not trying to come up with another 
uh, set of recommendations. It's focusing very concretely on case studies, on best practice, and on what we can do together to uh, operationalize and to implement uh, measures so that there's concrete progress uh, in expanding uh, meaningful access. And uh, in terms of outputs, I also think the group is innovative. You're not trying to come up with another report, but trying to come up with ideas on how we can do this together in the next phase. So the next phase, in my view, is uh, not to be content with another set of recommendations or another conversation, but really trying to come up with a plan to make this concrete. Some of the members in the conversation have come up with a model that is close to Gavi. And many of you know that the Global Alliance uh, for Vaccine is a very uh, unique, innovative partnership, tapping into resources from the public, the, uh, the development aid sector, the private sector, relying on existing UN system. And I think that the objective of meaningful access to the, three, 30, to the 34 percent of the global population still without access merits the commitment of resources and the commitment of capacity building and the use of the public and private sources in the partnership that is equal to the global alliance uh, for vaccine. It is of that importance. And I hope uh, in the following conversation after this, we would welcome you to work with us to make this a, a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Zhu. We really appreciate it. Appreciate your support and those really wonderful, wise words for moving forward. Thank you. I need to thank everyone. Unfortunately, we have to close and prepare for the next session. Um, I want to first thank my wonderful co-moderator and co-chair of the Policy Network, Silvia Cadena, um, and also Raquel and everyone on the Secretariat for making this possible. Uh, it's really teamwork, so thank you everyone. And uh, please stay tuned and don't leave the room or just leave for a little bit and come back for the next session on a multilingual internet. We are very proud to be here and to move this work forward. And also, thank you to the multi-stakeholder working group of the Policy Network. We're very honored to work with all of you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next session and online. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of the online participants. Uh, we're very, very happy that you joined us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.